everybody, welcome back for another video. This one's gonna be all about setting up your home studio for music production. And it doesn't matter whether you're a beginner or intermediate, advanced, what kind of production you're doing, um, you can put together a home studio and you can make great music at home. And today we're gonna to talk about how you can do that no matter what level you are, if you're just getting started or what your budget is. What's really important when you're setting up a home studio for music production is thinking at the start, what are you gonna be producing? What type of music are you gonna be producing? And what kind of instruments are you gonna be using? Uh, is everything you're gonna be doing gonna be digital and inside a computer? Or are you gonna be recording people singing? Are you gonna be recording acoustic instruments or live drums or things like that? All of those things will be important when you're deciding what you need and how you need to set up your home studio. Another thing that's really important when you're setting up a home studio is to think about the space you have. Are you doing this in the corner of your bedroom? Is it a shared space? Are you in a, an apartment with roommates? Is it a studio in a basement like where we are here? or do you have a dedicated music studio room that you're gonna be doing this in, all of those things will enter into what kind of gear you need as well. And probably one of the most important things for everyone when they're setting up their home music studio is their budget. Are you just getting started and on a really tight budget or do you have a whole bunch of money that you wanna splurge and you wanna spend on your dream studio? All of those things are important when you're setting up your home studio. So today we're gonna to run through options for all of these different things, how you can set things up on a budget as a beginner or as you get to be more and more advanced and what kind of gear you might wanna think about getting and why. And then if you stick around to the end, I'm gonna give you a tour around my studio and show you how I have it set up with different creative spaces, how I have things cabled and wired, what kind of gear I selected for my studio and why. So as a beginner, one of the first things you might wanna think about when you're talking talking about making music is using this right here. Everyone's got one of these in their pockets. There's tons of great software out there for phones right now. A lot of it free, a lot of it really, really cheap. Um, if you wanna start messing around with making beats and making different songs in your in your phone or on your iPad or, or things like that. If you have an iOS device, you have GarageBand that's free and you can get started right away with that. Um, and then there's a lot of other instruments that you can add in. Just as an example, um, here in my phone, I have a Moog synthesizer. And you can set this up to actually go through your bigger sound system and use it later on as a virtual instrument and you can get started just playing around with stuff just on your phone. Uh, the next thing you might wanna think about as a beginner is um, maybe a groove box. There's some great groove boxes out there. And what I mean when I say groove box is kind of an all-in-one piece of hardware where you can create sounds, put them together, create beats, put them together and actually string them together and make, in some cases, basic tracks and in some cases, complete tracks all inside a hardware box. One of the best ones out there for kind of a, a beginner intermediate level, but that you could actually grow into and actually use for a long time after that is the Novation Circuit Tracks. You can get a Circuit Tracks new for about $399. Um, you can get a Generation 1 Circuit used for about $329. I'll put some affiliate links down in the description of all the gear that we talk about today. So if there's any of it that you're interested in and you wanna take a look at, you can go ahead and click on one of those links and grab that and at no extra cost to you, I'll get a little kickback and it'll help support the channel. Option number three as a beginner is kind of the beginner way to set up your first real studio that you may grow into. Um, and that would be using a computer and using a DAW, using software and things that you might wanna to use to control that. One of the best ways to do that, if you already have a computer in your house, whether it's a desktop or a laptop, is to uh, get a controller. And a lot of controllers will come bundled with uh, some free basic software. And it's a great way to get your foot in the door with certain uh, software that you might wanna use and you might wanna kind of grow with and upgrade to more and more advanced uh, versions of it as you get better and better at music production. One really great example of a software controller, one of my personal favorites and the one that I would recommend uh, for a beginner is the Arturia Mini Lab. Um, this keyboard is great. It is uh, 25 keys. It has some drum pads. It's got some great knobs, really, really good quality, really well built. Um, and it's one that you'll be able to keep using for years. Um, you can use it as a beginner and you can keep using it for years as you build your studio around it. One of the great things about the, the Mini Lab and a whole bunch of the other Arturia products 
is they come bundled with software. If you get this, this is about, I think this is $110 new um, used. You can get them a little bit cheaper than that. And the new ones come bundled with Ableton Live Lite, which is the very basic version of Ableton Live. It gives you eight tracks so you can kind of learn how to use their uh, their workflow and their interface. This also comes bundled with the Arturia Analog Lab Lite, uh, which is a software suite of synthesizers and instruments that are virtual instruments that you use within your DAW. This comes with 500 preset sounds in 17 different classic vintage synthesizers. And you can tweak all of those sounds. You've got some pretty simple parameters that you can use with those. And if you end up liking that, you can upgrade to a more advanced version of the V collection later, where you can get full featured versions of all of those synthesizers. You can upgrade to a more advanced version of Ableton Live uh, later on as well, if that ends up being the DAW that you enjoy. But what's great about this is for just over a hundred bucks, you get a great controller that's really well built and it's gonna last for a long time. It will do all of the stuff that you need a controller to do as far as playing notes in, has the drum pads and some knobs for um, mapping to different things in your software, and it comes with the software. So if you've already got a computer, basically for just over a hundred bucks, you can get right into your first basic digital audio workstation based music production setup. Uh, the last piece of gear that you're gonna want at the beginner level, whether you're using your phone, whether you're using a groove box or whether you're using a computer with a DAW and a controller is some headphones. At this point, you may or may not need speakers. If you don't, it's okay. You can do pretty much everything you want if you get a good set of headphones. So invest 50 to 100 bucks in a um, an adequate set of headphones that will be able to get you started and let you be able to hear what you need to hear out of whatever piece of equipment that you're using for right now. And you can always move on from that later. As you move on beyond the beginner level, we're gonna start to look at either hardware-based workflows or software-based workflows or some kind of hybrid combination of the two. So if you're gonna stick with a hardware-based workflow or you want your workflow based around hardware, um, that circuit tracks that you got at the beginner level, or if you didn't go for that, this would be a place that you might wanna go for that because it can act as kind of a central hub. It's very economical for what it does. The capabilities are pretty amazing for $399. Um, it's able to control outside instruments. You can connect it to your computer, to your DAW, your digital audio workstation. Um, you can use it as a MIDI controller to control different things within your software, or it's got a synthesizer built right into it. It's got samples built into it. Um, so it can do a lot of things and it can integrate with the software as well. The next kind of step up version of a groove box um, would be something like the Roland MC-707. Um, as you can see, a bunch of different controllers, um, sliders, knobs, all of these can be used with an internal synth engine that this has. Also can play samples. You can connect this also to your computer, to your DAW if you would like to, or you can use this completely by itself to write patterns, write tracks, and, um, and structure them into basically full-blown tracks at this level with, uh, with a groove box just like this one. Another groove box you might look at at this level if you wanna start um, moving into the hardware world is something like the Electron Digitact. Um, this is a sample-based workflow, sample player and sampler. It's got a sequencer so you can sequence other outside instruments if you decide to build into that, or you can sequence eight different tracks of different samples within this, built-in effects, things like that. These are about $750 used, $799 new. Uh, the MC-707 is about $999 new and about $900 used. Um, and again, I'll link to all these in the description down below if you wanna check out any of the, the specs and the actual hardware itself. But all three of these would be ways that you could get into kind of the hardware world. And with something like Digitact or the MC-707 um, or even the circuit tracks, that's something that if you were to get it now and start to use it and learn how to use it, it's not something that you'd outgrow quickly. It's something that you could actually build on and continue using within your setup for a long time to come. That brings up something I think is really important to talk about at this level is as you're starting to buy equipment, whether it's 
a computer, whether it's software, uh, you know, whether it's a DAW, whether it's hardware pieces like a groove box or a synthesizer. One thing that I would always recommend is buy less gear, but buy better gear at each level so that you don't have to constantly get rid of gear and upgrade it as you develop and as you move on in your abilities. You want to get gear that you're going to stick with or get gear that can stick with you uh, for a lot longer time. And it's worth the investment up front because most of this gear will last years and years and years and you lose a little bit of value each time you sell gear. So if you were to get a piece of equipment like the Electron Digitagged or like the MC707 or the Circuit Tracks or um, kind of an entry level synthesizer, look for something that's gonna be able to grow with you. Um, also at this level, you might wanna start thinking about synthesizers. If you are planning on using hardware system or you wanna use a hybrid system combining hardware synthesizers with your digital audio workstation, a couple of great synthesizers um, to get started with at kind of the entry level price, but they're, they're those pieces of equipment that are gonna be able to grow with you. Um, I would highly recommend the this one, the Roland SH-01A. Um, this is part of their boutique line of synthesizers. It's kind of a, a redo of one of their classic retro synthesizers. Great for learning synthesis, because it's really simple, but the sounds are really, really great. And you can get these for about $399. Um, and it's something that you'll use for years to come, even though it uh, it's relatively small and compact and runs on batteries if you want it to. It's, um, it's actually a really powerful synth that has a fantastic sound that I still use all the time in my productions today. Another great synthesizer at this level is the Korg Minilog XD. It is a four note polyphonic synthesizer, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, um, that is, also really great sounding analog synthesizer and it has some really great features that are easy to understand at the beginning but they're really deep and really powerful that can kind of move along with you so it's a great first entry level synth next at this intermediate level if you want to use exclusively computer-based or DAW based uh, production or if you'd like to combine that with some of the hardware pieces this is where you're going to want to start to look at a more full featured DAW now there's a bunch of different brands of DAW out there and they range in price from very inexpensive to free all the way up to hundreds of dollars even a thousand dollars so it really kind of depends on what you're looking to invest. A lot of these software or a lot of these pieces of software, you can buy an entry level version of it and then upgrade as you need the added features and as you can afford it as you move along. At the entry price level for full feature DAWs would be Reaper. It's about $60. Um, fully functioning version for $60, which is is pretty amazing. Uh, next up in the price range, um, very, very robust piece of software is uh, Logic Pro if you are a Mac user. It's only available in the in the Mac operating system, uh, but Logic Pro is $199 and that's for the full featured version of it. And that gets you all the features that you get in a lot of the other ones that we'll talk about for a much higher price. So if you're on a Mac operating system, Logic Pro is a great option. Really good user interface, really easy to use and very robust. The next one that we want to talk about, um, very popular out there, is FL Studio. It used to be called Fruity Loops years ago. It was actually my very first DAW. I think I got it in 2001, maybe, so 20 years ago now. Um, interesting thing with FL Studio is whichever version you buy now, you buy that version and then upgrades at that same level of the version as they come out with new versions of the software are free. So as they move into their all their different versions, my version that I got almost 20 years ago, I still get free upgrades today. So if I was still using FL Studio, I could use the most upgraded version of it today based on that one price that I paid 20 years ago. So it's a great, kind of DAW ecosystem to get into because it is full featured, great DAW used by a lot of really well-known producers and it's free upgrades for the life of the product. Uh, the different versions of FL Studio range from about, I think $99 at the low end all the way up to $499 at the high end. And again, whichever version you buy, 
all of the upgrades at that version level are free all along. So if you get the lowest level, you can upgrade when they come out with the new version to the next lowest level um, and you don't have to pay anything extra. If you get the highest version with all of the different plugins and all of the different extra synths and effects and things like that, when the new versions come out of all of those things and any new features that they add to that highest end, you get all of those new things as a free upgrade. Next up is my preferred DAW, uh, which is Ableton Live. I've been using Ableton now for probably about 10 years and absolutely love it. Wouldn't trade it for anything, it's my favorite, but your DAW is kind of a personal preference choice. It's kind of like Mac or PC or Windows, Android. Kind of everybody has their own personal preferences of what they like to use. Um, I'm a big fan of Ableton Live. I'm very quick with it now, so that has become a really important part of the way that I work so that I can get things out really, really quickly. Uh, Ableton Live comes in a bunch of different versions. You can get the Live Lite, which comes with uh, some different controllers like we were talking about for, before, for free. Um, then there's a $99 version, then there's a full version, I think, which is $299. Um, and then there's a $499 version, and then there's a $749 version, which includes everything that you could imagine. Generally, Ableton Live, uh, the upgrades from version to version and the upgrades whenever they come out with the new version of it are generally about 200 bucks, 250 bucks. It, it just depends on the on what you're upgrading from what to what. One thing to consider when you're talking about these full featured versions is they come with a lot of different internal synthesizers and effects, audio effects and MIDI effects and things like that, which keeps you from having to pay for those, uh, paying for outside plugins and, and things like that. They also come with pretty extensive sample libraries. So like, for example, if you were to get the, the full version of Ableton Live, the 749 version, you get 70 gigs worth of samples, which are great to be able to use in your productions as well. Also, if you're gonna be doing things in the box at this level, you're gonna to wanna to get a better MIDI controller. Um, the Arturi one that I spoke about before, you can still use that, absolutely. Uh, but you might wanna get one with a little bit longer key bed so that you have more of a range to be able to play things in, um, more pads, more functionality, or to, is able to control your DAW, for example. Um, I'll link to the one that I really like, which is also another Arturi keyboard, which is the Keylab 61. Um, it's a 61 key and it has some great controls on it for controlling your DAW and things like that. Uh, the next thing at this level that you're going to want to look into is an audio interface. Now, at the beginner level, headphones are generally enough to get by with. Um, once you get to this level, you're going to want an audio interface so that you can connect some speakers, get some high quality, but entry level speakers. So um, what I recommend at this level is something like the KRK Rockets or uh, Mackie makes some really good speakers at this level as well. And the audio interface will link your computer via USB so that the audio coming out of your DAW can go out into your speakers so that you can get a much better representation of how that track is gonna sound in a final version. Something else that an audio interface lets you do is connect outboard instruments. So if you are gonna be doing synthesizers and things like that, if they don't have USB out, uh, they would have what's called MIDI out. And I did a whole nother video that I'll link up above here about how to connect things via MIDI. And USB, um, is one way to connect your computer, but MIDI is another, and you might wanna go through an interface in order to do that. A lot of audio interfaces will have also a MIDI interface, and audio interfaces is also the way you can get the audio, the sound from a synthesizer into your DAW if it doesn't have audio over USB. The audio interface will also allow you to connect a microphone. So at this level, you might wanna start thinking about microphones. Um, a lot of great microphones out there as far as microphones that kind of last forever, I'm a big fan of Shure microphones. They, I've been using them for as long as I've been in music and I have microphones that have lasted 20 plus years and they're fantastic, they're bulletproof, they sound great, and uh, they're inexpensive. Also at this level, you're probably gonna wanna start to look into uh, upgrading your headphones from the ones you had before. It doesn't mean you have to throw away the old ones or get rid of them. You can use them for just kind of uh, casual listening, but at this level, you're gonna wanna be looking for something different in headphones, and that is something that doesn't color the sound at all. And what that means is, is a lot of uh, headphones that are designed for casual listening are 
you're gonna do things like boost the bass sound so that you can hear a fuller sounding bass, or they're gonna boost the higher end so that you can hear the higher frequencies more clearly. What you want in a set of stu uh, studio production headphones is something that doesn't color the sound at all. So you get a really true representation of what you're making so that when somebody else is listening to it on whatever kind of sound system, they're gonna hear it the way you intended it. If you have headphones that boost the bass, for example, and you listen and you're you're changing the sound of the bass or the, the level of the bass in your song, it's gonna sound like it's great in those headphones because the headphones are boosting the bass, but then and when you hear that same song without that bass boost, the bass is gonna sound weak. So you wanna make sure that you get something that will not color your sound. And once again, at this level, buy less gear, but buy better gear. And it's the gear that will be able to grow with you as you improve in your music production and not things that are gonna be disposable and be kind of a waste of money as you go along. So next we're gonna talk about building your dream studio, whether you're beginner, intermediate, advanced, um, once you get to the point where you can start adding in all the things you've wanted to, or as you grow your studio and you're adding in all of the things that you've dreamed about piece by piece, what are those things that you're gonna wanna put into your studio? And what are you gonna wanna be thinking about? So obviously you have drum machines and groove boxes. We already talked a bunch about those. Then when we start talking about synthesizers, we're gonna wanna look at a couple of different things. Um, first of all is monophonic versus polyphonic. Monophonic synthesizers means that they can play one note mono, one note at a time, one voice at a time. These tend to be really good, really thick sounds for things like bass sounds and leads. They're gonna be really clear, really powerful sounds. Polyphonic, poly meaning multiple, this can be number of voices from four to 16, even more. Um, they can be played at the same time. So this is where you can play chords and you can uh, have those big rich pad sounds and string sounds and things like that, that you can't get from playing one voice at a time. You wanna have multiple voices playing multiple notes at a time. The next thing to consider at this level is the type of synthesis, the type of sound. So are you looking for an analog synthesizer, meaning it's circuits and analog sound path all the way through the synthesizer. There are digital analog emulators, which means they're digital synthesizers, but they're made to emulate the sound of analog synthesizers. Then you have what's called wavetable synthesizers. This uses different unique sound waves and pieces of sound waves to generate really interesting sounds. Uh, then you also have FM synthesis, which is frequency modulation synthesis. So it's one sound wave modulating or changing another sound wave. So all different types and they have each have unique characteristics. With your synthesizers, you might add in effects pedals or outboard effects units, things like that. Too many to go into here, that's for a whole nother video, uh, but that's a whole nother world of, uh, of hardware. And then you'll also have at this level, a much higher level of speaker than what you did at the last time. It, it becomes more and more important, the more advanced you get, that you get a really true sound in your productions from whatever speakers you're using. At this level, there's a lot of great speakers out there. Everything from Yamaha to Atom Audio, uh, KRK makes great ones at this level. So look into that and figure out what works best for the type of music that you wanna do, for the size of the space that you have, and for your particular listening environment. And then with speakers, you're also gonna wanna look at this point at speaker stands, something to get them up off of your table so that they're isolated, so that you're getting, again, a more true sound and you're not getting the sound vibrations from the speakers reverberating whatever table they're sitting on. So you're gonna to wanna to put them on the sound isolating stands. Next, at this kind of advanced or dream studio level, when we're looking at the DAW, this is the time when you're gonna to wanna to look at full featured DAW, all the bells and whistles that you would use for what you do. And that doesn't necessarily mean you need everything that you can get, um, but you'll find things that are specific to the type of music that you make and the type of producing that you do. Plug-in software synthesizers at this point are gonna be important depending on what type of music you're making. Um, my three favorites are a classic, which is Silenth. Um, I love the Yuhei Diva. Um, it's, a, it's a virtual analog synthesizer and it sounds amazing when you compare it to regular analog synthesizers, but it's completely inside a computer software. 
And then uh, I love Arteria pigments as well because for every other type of sound that you don't get out of an analog synthesizer or out of a classic synth like a Silent, every other sound you could want to make, you can make with pigments because you can add in samples or waveforms and do wavetable synthesis, or you can do simple FM synthesis. You can do all sorts of things within pigments. So you can make kind of any other sound that you'd like. So that's it for how to set up your own home studio. Now we're going to take a look at mine um, and how I have it set up into a bunch of different workspaces for the things that I like to do and the way that I enjoy playing music and making music. All right. So this might be a little bumpy. Sorry for that. A little handheld action here. So just to talk about the different areas that I have in my studio. First of all, this is where I have my live setup. Um, so all of my hardware equipment, groove boxes, uh, drum machines, things like that, that I like to use as a standalone live setup without uh, using my DAW. Although this is all connected via audio and MIDI into my DAW so that I can use these as part of my DAW setup if I want to as well. Then moving around, I have on this side my uh, monophonic synthesizers. So I have the Arturi Matrix Brute and then the SHO1A that I spoke with before, that I spoke about before. And then right next to that is the Moog Minotaur, which is a great little monophonic bass synth. Uh, then my desk workstation, um, it's actually adjustable so that it, uh, you can adjust up the height so that you can get it up to be a standing desk as well. Um, monitor that I use for my Mac Mini, which is actually down underneath there. Um, up above here, I have uh, Tascam US 20 by 20 audio interface so that I can run all of the audio inputs from all of the different synthesizers into my DAW so that I can record each one of them separately. And then above is the Mio iConnectivity XL, and that is uh, routing all of the different MIDI channels um, from all of the different synthesizers to their different things. Um, forgot to mention over here, I have uh, Mackie speakers, which used to be my uh, main speakers that I used until I upgraded a while ago to the Atom Audio. So I have those as well. Have them on stands that are mounted on the desk so that as the desk raises up, they raise up as well. And I have the same stands over here um, to keep those up at height for performing when I stand up. Um, so this kind of central workstation, um, TV monitor back there in the back, and then the key lab, the Arturia key lab, 61 key MIDI controller in the middle. And then over here on this side, I have polyphonic synthesizers. Um, right now, the Minilog XD from Korg and the Prolog from Korg. So two different polyphonic synthesizers that are both run audio and MIDI into the DAW. Another really important part of all of this too is the chair, <laughs> as dumb as that sounds. Um, I just got this chair recently and I really love it. It's a uh, Secret Lab Titan chair. It's a gaming chair, but absolutely super comfortable for long studio sessions. Uh, down below the desk, I keep my DJ equipment. And as you can see, the desk adjusts automatically in height with a push of a button. And the speakers, because they're attached to the desk, they raise up with it. So they stay at ear level, stay at good listening level, whether you're seated at the lower desk or once the desk moves up, they move up with it. So standing, they still stay at the right kind of listening position. One other area that I have is down here, down below. I've got some storage shelves that are for different types of cables. I have it organized. So there's audio cables in one, MIDI cables in another, USB cables in another. Also have some other synths down here that I'm not using at the moment. I've got the, I've got a Behringer. I've got a little mixer down here. Um, another little Behringer synth. And some other speakers for when I DJ and perform out. But this is kind of where I store things away. So one of the things that was really important for me when I was setting up the studio is that I could control everything from one central spot. So the way I have this set up right here is that I can control any of the synths from here, from this central keyboard, and then just change the 
whatever MIDI channel it's working on, um, that MIDI channel will control a different synthesizer. Um, so basically what I'm able to do here is, let's say I'm controlling the Matrix Bird here, and I'm doing something here that I like, but I wanna go and mess around with the sound, then I can just move over here and actually control the sound up here and control all the parameters up here. So I can use this to rough in ideas here on the MIDI controller on any one of the synthesizers. And then if I wanna flesh that idea out, or let's say I'm working on something on one of the synthesizers, and then I wanna be able to do something in the DAW so and still have access to the keyboard right in front of me, that's why I have it set up the way that I do. <laughs> It's also important that from this spot, I've got all of my um, monophonic synthesizers over here on one side. So all of the bass lines and lead synthesizers over here. And then over on this side, I have all of the, or both of the polyphonic synthesizers. So I can do more pads and more kind of big sounds with those. So I can keep that workflow separated into two separate areas. Um, you'll also notice that the whole hardware setup is a separate area because when I'm working on that, I like to keep that as a completely separate workflow. So I'm just using the hardware and not messing with anything that's in the software. It is run into Ableton Live so that I can track out all of the different things that I'm doing on the different instruments over there. Um, but I basically just use Ableton Live like a multi-track recorder at that point. It's not really um, doing much. Unless I decide to use a piece in production, I do have it connected through Overbridge so that if I want to use, for example, the, uh, the analog rhythm to do drums, I can still track those drums out in Ableton Live from over there. Um, but in general, I like to keep those as separate workflows. I like this production center as one area and then the hardware stuff as a totally separate area. So that's it for today. I hope you got something out of this video and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Stay creative. Cheers.